The Peter Schiff Show. Well, we got the December jobs report, uh, I guess the first big number of the new year. And once again, the headline number was better than estimates. They were expecting 245,000 jobs added in December. Instead, we added 252,000 jobs, so a small beat, but they actually revised last month. Remember, we got that real surprise, that 321,000 jobs created in November. They now say that this is 353,000 jobs, so they added that up. And also, more good news, the unemployment rate, which was expected to drop from 5.8 to 5.7, drop all the way down to 5.6%. So the headlines are jobs up, unemployment down, everything is great. Again, not so fast because you can't just look at the headlines when it comes to the jobs numbers. First, in the official numbers, there was one disappointing number, and that was the average hourly earnings. Because last month, they were up 0.4, which was a big jump. They were expecting another 0.2 this month. Instead, this month or December was minus 0.2, minus, not plus, minus 0.2. That was the biggest drop in eight years in average hourly earnings. And they went back to that plus 0.4 from November and they revised that down. They cut it in half. So now it's only up plus two. So a big disappointment in the hourly earnings. So if you're looking for more earnings to drive the economy, we didn't get it. Now, of course, you've got a lot of people looking at the Fed. The Fed is focusing on earnings. uh, And if they want more income, they're not getting that either. But the real bad news was the labor force participation rate that continues to sink, hitting a new low. We had been at 62.8. Now we're at 62.7. That's the lowest in 38 years. Now, you have to go back to 1977 when women were entering the labor force in droves, right, to find a year where labor force participation was as low as it is right now. And you know what's really a problem with the labor force participation rate, again, that no one talks about, is for older Americans, labor force participation is actually on the rise. Over 55 It's not falling. And in fact, Americans in the 60s and 70s are working in their largest percentages ever. The real collapse in the labor force participation is among younger people. And that's why when you have people like even Janet Yellen dismissing this as being, well, it's demographics, it's the baby boomers retiring. They're not retiring. They want to. That's the problem. They can't afford to. Now, the young people, they're the ones who should be working. They can't get jobs. So the, the, the number is actually worse than it seems. 92.9 million Americans now not in the labor force. 92.9. I wonder when that number is going to hit 100 million Americans not working. And, you know, a big problem, too, is going to be the Social Security because they need the young workers uh, entering the workforce to pay the taxes so that the few Americans who can still afford to retire can actually do it. Although... Uh, Now Americans are working so long that they can work and collect Social Security. But collect from who if we don't have the young workers? And in fact, there's another survey that comes out, the household survey. The establishment survey is the one that everybody talks about. That's where you get the unemployment rate, the number of non-farm jobs uh, added to the payrolls. But the household survey showed that 450,000 people left the labor force in December while only 110,000 people actually got jobs. That's on the household survey. So as far as that survey is concerned, for every one person who entered the labor force, four people left. Lousy, lousy number. And here's another statistic. In December, 43,600 people got jobs, waiting tables and tending bar. That's the highest number added in that segment since 2012. And chances are, you know, a lot of these waiters and waitresses are A, working part-time. A lot of them could be in their 60s, right? And I bet most of them have college degrees. 
So this is really, again, not a good report. And I think still it's a function of all the hysteria and hype. Employers are kind of loading up on workers, anticipating a recovery. They're reluctant to let go of workers uh, because they're waiting for the recovery. And so I think things are going to change here in 2015. I think uh, a lot of business owners are going to throw in the towel and realize that, once again, they've been fooled by a promised recovery that never actually materializes. And I think we're going to see a pickup in layoffs. And we know we're going to get a pickup in layoffs in the energy sector. Oil prices continued to fall during the week, you know, closing below uh, $50 a barrel. I think we're about $48 a barrel. And so the layoffs in the energy sector have not even begun. Uh, So these numbers aren't even reflected yet in the payroll numbers, but they will be. Now, we also got some news on Thursday, consumer credit. And consumer credit was supposed to rise in November. These are November numbers. They were supposed to rise by $15 billion. Instead, it only rose by $14.1 billion. So a smaller rise than expected. But here's the real, the real bad news or the real story. Credit card balances actually dropped by the most in a year. So the credit that was added was student loans and auto loans. So Americans are borrowing all this money to buy cars and go to college. <clears throat> Despite the fact that there's not a lot of jobs out there for the college degrees, I think, again, a lot of the people who are utilizing student loans are simply going to college to get the loans, more so than the education, and they spend the money on rent and whatever they need. So you have a lot of people borrowing money uh, using this method, but The fact that consumers are cutting back on their credit card spending to me shows that they're tightening their belts. And I think that's a good thing because they're in bad shape, but they're tightening their belts during the expansion. I mean, if they have to tighten their belts during the recovery, what are they going to do with their belts during the next recession? That's what I want to know. right. So and in fact, along those lines, we got the auto delinquencies. This was an article on Friday in the Wall Street Journal that pointed out that auto delinquencies are now at their highest rate since 2008. Let that sink in. See, 2008 was the depths of the financial crisis. It was uh, the Great Recession, right? Unemployment was sky high with 10%. And now our delinquent auto loans are the same now as they were then. Now, if this is a 5% growing economy, as indicated by the last GDP, yet we're having... uh, this high a default rate on auto loans, what's going to happen during the next downturn? Remember, this is all because of these subprime auto loans, because once the government, after Obama bailed out the auto industry, he wanted the auto industry to succeed, to showcase the success of the bailout. And since the government took over all the auto finance companies, they basically dropped their lending standards so that anybody who could fog a mirror can drive out of the showroom with a new car. Uh, The problem is, though, when you sell cars to people who can't afford them, they don't. They don't make the payments, and that's what's already happening, and you're getting these defaults. And a lot of these people have auto loans that go seven, eight years. You know, the warranties only go four years, maybe five, but these are long payments so that people become go underwater very quickly because unlike a home, right, cars depreciate rapidly. It's going to depreciate a lot faster than the uh, the eight-year loan. I mean, generally... Every four years or so, a car loses half its value. So after eight years, you buy a new car, it's lost 75% of its value. So somewhere along that curve, a guy decides, hey, I can't make my car payment. Meanwhile, my car is worth less than my loan, so I'm just going to mail in my keys. And this is already starting. Although a lot of times the companies have to repossess these cars because the people don't often mail in their keys. They just stop mailing in their checks. And now the car companies have got to track down these cars. But this is an indication, again, of a bubble. Consumers are running out of credit. They really had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to stuff this channel and sell all of these cars. Meanwhile, on student loans, now you got President Obama coming out this week, and he wants to make community college free, free for all Americans. Now, what is this going to do to the cost of going to the community college? Obviously, it's going to skyrocket because if you can go to community college for free, well, a lot more people are going to want to go, right? Demand goes up. Plus, Obama says that in order for the community college to qualify for free tuition, 
the courses have to transfer, the credit has to transfer to a four-year college, meaning you go to a two-year community college and then you can graduate from a four-year college. Well, if four years, if a regular college, if you have to pay for all four years, but you can go to a community college for free, then more people are going to want to start out at community college and then transfer as a junior to a four-year college because they can save money that way. But in other words, the, ju- the junior colleges will have to jack up their, commi- their, 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 their charges, and they're not going to have a lot of pushback because you're going to have so many people who want to go because, after all, it's free. But it's not free. It costs a lot of money. In fact, the most expensive stuff is the stuff the government provides for free because now you separate the payer right, from the guy who decides to go. So a kid enrolls in school, and now the federal government and the state government have to pick up the tab, whatever it is. And again, I think a lot of people will enroll in these junior colleges, not because they even want the degrees, but because they want the money. Although apparently you have to maintain a 2.5 GPA, which at a junior college is pretty easy to do. I mean, you talk about grade inflation. I mean, if you can't get a 2.5% GPA at a junior college, right, and you only have to go part-time. You, 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 could, you only have to be part-time student. You don't have to do full-time. I think the president said you have to have a, a you know, a half a year load. So theoretically, you could be at a two-year college for four years, all on the government, right? So all this, again, is going to add to the demand, add to the price, but subtract from the value, right? Because if more people go to junior college, what are the degrees worth? Well, the more people that have them, the less marketable value they have. And of course, most of these courses deliver very little in the way of market value. Fed Governor Charles Evans was on CNBC Uh, Steve Leisman sat around a big table talking about, um, you know, interest rates and inflation. And in some of the, you know, dovish comments, most ridiculous, idiotic comments uttered by a Fed governor, a voting member of the FOMC, this guy basically said, look, we need more inflation. I think what we have to keep in mind, though, in terms of the overall stance of monetary policy is that we also have to be paying attention to inflation. And that wage number that you saw this morning going down is somewhat indicative of the low inflation pressures that we've been seeing. Uh, earnings growth, you know, on average, it's been about two to two and a quarter percent across a variety of measures. And now it's lower uh, for uh, average early uh, hourly earnings this this morning. I think if we're going to get inflation up to our 2% objective, and it's now like 1.5% on court, a little bit less than that, we're going to have to see wages uh, increase more. So I think that's indicative of one of the dilemmas we're facing, and that's why I'm in favor of uh, being patient on uh, raising interest rates. you got to be kidding. I mean, first of all, low inflation is not bad. I mean, it's worse than no inflation. No inflation is better than low inflation, but low inflation is a lot better than high inflation. But this guy thinks that it's better to have inflation too high than too low. That's how nutty he is. And because it's still too low, right, uh, Steve Leisman says, look, you know, the economy is growing, got 5% GDP growth. We got low unemployment. How can you tell me that the the appropriate rate of interest is zero, right? And his answer is, it's the, that is appropriate because inflation is still too low. Inflation is still below two and a half, two percent. It's one and a half. I mean, the way and, and as if the government's measuring rod is so precise that it can really differentiate between one and a half and two percent inflation. But no, because it's only reading one percent, not two percent. We need to keep interest rates at zero. And he's basically looking at wage growth. And he says, look, we need three to four percent wage growth as if he's going to achieve that by keeping interest rates at zero or by printing money. And then when, when Joe Curtin said, well, you know, aren't you worried about like maybe causing a bubble somewhere? I mean, if you keep interest rates at zero to try to get more inflation, aren't you worried that, you know, it could create a problem, you know, kind of like from the housing bubble and the financial crisis? And then Evans basically said, are you kidding? There's no connection whatsoever, no link between our low interest rates and the f- housing bubble and the financial crisis. Uh, I disagree with your characterization of 2004 from low funds rate to 2008. To do with it. I, well, I don't think that's causality. I, I mean, that that it's a big people, leap. People. That it just happened to be a coincidence that the Fed had interest rates at 1%, and at the same time, there just happened to be a housing bubble that burst with a financial crisis, that the Fed's monetary policy played no part in it. That if the Fed had had higher interest rates, if the Fed had had tight money, there could have just as easily been a housing bubble. I mean, could you believe this guy? But these are the the morons that are in charge of monetary policy. I don't understand how the dollar did not sell off more. I mean, the dollar rose all week. 
uh, both on the release of the Fed minutes, which really didn't say anything except, you know, the Fed still believes that the economy is strong. But of course, they're going to say that no matter what. Even if they thought it was about to go over a cliff, they would never admit it. They would always say it's strong. And it's crazy. You get this huge rally in the stock market the day of the minutes, the day after the minutes. Everybody's enthusiastic because the Fed is confident. Right. Well, the dollar rally, when you get a Fed guy saying this stuff, don't understand why the dollar didn't sell off. The dollar did go down on Friday. You know, it finished the week on a down note, even though it was stronger on the week. Uh, But given comments like that and other comments that happened throughout the week about the Fed governors being patient. And to me now, the word patient, right, seems like it is going to be longer than considerable period. Right. If you look at what the Fed is saying, the reason that they took out the words considerable period is because it somehow implied a, a time, right? A period of, of months or you know, three months, six months, nine months. So everybody wanted to know what that considerable period was. And so that was a problem for the Fed because they didn't know and they didn't want people looking at a calendar. So patient now, they're saying, Well, we don't know how long it is. We're just We're just not in a hurry, and we're going to be data dependent. We're in no rush. And in my mind, the word patient probably implies an even longer time period than considerable period because they knew they were going to be patient. And and, and they also knew that it would be a while before they would raise rates. I mean, basically never. I don't think they, they want to raise rates. But they just said, look, you know, they knew they would be patient, and they knew that their patience would be a considerable period, so they used the words considerable period. But now, because people were speculating about how long that period was, they said, look, we're now just going to be patient. And patient means exactly what we meant when we said considerable period. But to me, now that they're focusing on patient, I think patient might even imply a longer time period than whatever people were assuming would be considerable period. Gold continued to trade very well throughout the week. It finished on another positive note. I think we're above 1,220 in U.S. dollars. Gold stocks extremely strong on the day, on the week, leading the markets thus far in 2015. In fact, one of the only sectors, maybe the only sector that's actually positive on the year. Now, despite the big run-up we had uh, on Wednesday and Thursday, we did give back a lot of that on Friday, and it's still been a weak year thus far in 2015 for stocks, but gold stocks, again, very strong. And gold continued to rise, uh, certainly against other currencies. I mean, huge moves up after that breakout that I noted uh, in the euro price of gold and the Swiss franc gold. uh, Gold, in terms of those currencies, continues uh, to rise. And I think this will continue to generate interest in the precious metal around the world. And we'll see next week if this trend continues. But the fact that gold, A, was strong, even in a rising dollar environment, to me, indicates a lot of strength. And to me, it indicates that when the the dollar resumes its downward trend, uh, that gold's upward trend is going to be supercharged once it's no longer swimming against the tide. Once, you know, you have a weak dollar environment, that's the environment where gold really thrives, not just a weak euro uh, or a weak yen, but a weak dollar is the best market for gold. And also the fact that we did have a sell-off in the dollar and a rally in gold on the last day of the week, despite a you know better-than-expected jobs report. I mean, forget about all the, the details. They never care about all the negative details. It's just the headlines, as far as everybody is concerned. And you know we got this actually 170-point sell-off uh, to end the week. And so maybe that last dip, everybody bought that last dip in the stock market and they got saved by the Fed in the minutes. And hey, you see, you buy the dip the minute we have a pullback. Well, we'll see. Maybe we'll take out those lows next week because the fact that the dollar went down and gold went up, maybe that shows that people are starting to figure out uh, that this recovery story, right, is more fantasy than reality and that the fantasy is going to be fading. And now it's going to be, a a real critical juncture for the Fed. And I think we're going to get more comments like the one we just had from Evans with the Fed backtracking, uh, reiterating how patient they're going to be, how they need more inflation. Uh, We got to make sure this recovery sticks. They're going to start to walk back uh, their rhetoric on on higher rates because the last thing they want to do, 
given the fact that the economy is already weakening, is push it over the cliff with rate hikes. Even though, of course, higher interest rates are exactly what the economy needs in the long run. But any cure, any long run cure to our economic problems is going to involve a lot of short term pain. In fact, because we waited so long, the pain is going to be that much worse than had we bitten the bullet years ago. But because it involves short term pain, it's never going to happen. And, you know, the rhetoric is heating up. The elections now, everybody's talking about the 2016 presidential election cycle. Nobody wants a recession between now and then, even if we get one. But if we do, they're going to try to alleviate the pain. Nobody wants to be seen as doing nothing, least of all the Fed officials. So I think they're, again, they're queuing up this QE4. When they're going to launch it, I don't know, but I still think it's coming. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies.